Good evening, I'm Andrea J. Aviren. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Graduate Center, and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's event, Is Zionism in Crisis? A follow-up debate, which is part of our series, Perspectives with Peter Beinart. Produced by G the GC's Public Programs Office and co-sponsored by the Graduate School of Journalism, the Perspective series features dynamic thinkers and practitioners examining some of the most urgent political and public policy issues shaping our world today. For a complete list of our upcoming public programs, I'd invite you to visit the Graduate Center's website, where you will also find information about our membership program. Tonight, following their impassioned conversation this past fall, Peter Beinart will re-engage with Alan Dershowitz on the topic of Zionism, this time with Ethan Bronner serving as moderator. Let me just say a few brief words about our distinguished participants so that we can begin the discussion. First, we're indebted to Peter Beinart, who has been instrumental in organizing and producing this series. He is a Schwartz Senior Fellow at the New America Foundation and Associate Professor of Journalism and Political Science at CUNY's Graduate Center and Graduate School of Journalism. He is also Senior Political Writer for The Daily Beast, as well as the editor of its blog, Open Zion, a contributor to Time, and the author of The Icarus Syndrome, A History of American Hubris, and most recently, The Crisis of Zionism. We also have the honor of welcoming back to our stage someone who, again, needs no introduction, Alan Dershowitz. Professor Dershowitz is a Brooklyn native who has been called the nation's most peripatetic civil liberties lawyer and Israel's single most visible defender. A graduate of Brooklyn College and Yale Law School, Professor Dershowitz joined the Harvard Law School faculty at the age of 25, where he is now the Felix Frankfurter Professor of Law. He has published more than 100 articles in major magazines and journalisms and journals such as the New York Times Magazine, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal. Professor Dershowitz is also the author of 27 fiction and nonfiction non works. And can I just ask everyone, please, to be quiet? There will be a, a Q&A session at the end where you can ask questions and, and respond to our participants. Finally, we are very fortunate to have as our, as our moderator this evening, Ethan Bronner. Mr. Bronner is currently the National Legal Affairs Correspondent for the New York Times. He served as Jerusalem Bureau Chief for the Times from 2008 to 2012, following four years as the newspaper's deputy foreign editor. Mr. Bronner has also served as assistant editorial page editor of the Times and worked in the paper's investigative unit, focusing on the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks. A graduate of Wesleyan and the, Columbian, and the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism, Mr. Bronner began his career at Reuters in 1980, reporting from London, Madrid, Brussels, and Jerusalem. He worked at the Boston Globe for a dozen years, four of them as its legal and Supreme Court correspondent. He's the author of Battle for Justice, How the Bork Nomination Shook America, which was named one of the 25 best books of 1989 by the New York Public Library and awarded a silver gavel by the American Bar Association. I'd like to remind everyone to please turn off your cell phones and noise-making devices. And also, please remember that McNally Jackson will have books on sale in the lobby area. So now, please join me in welcoming Peter Beinart, Alan Dershowitz, and Ethan Bronner. So the idea that I'm going to moderate right, is sort of amusing with these two guys on either end of me here. Um, they're both uh, among the most articulate people out here on these issues. So we'll, th my goal will be to try to rein them in a little bit and keep them as honest as I can. Uh, they've had a, you know, a debate here some months ago, which tended to focus more on Iran. We'll try to do a little bit more maybe on Israel and Israel-Palestine today. Um, and the question that uh, that underlies this comes from the title of your book about whether Zionism is in crisis. So, you know, in a Clintonian way, I want to know what Zionism and what crisis are. So why don't we, Peter, why don't I start with you? Uh, from what I understood from the book, and I'll do this briefly, uh, you have a, um, probably a more Jewishly infused sense of, of Zionism than Alan does, uh, although I'm happy to hear you tell me I'm wrong. Um, <laughs> And, uh, that, and he, in, in fact, at the last debate, which I watched, said to you, you want a Jewish state, I want a homeland for the Jewish people. Um, so my first question is, do you favor, in fact, the separation of church and state in Israel? 
I favor um, not entirely. Um, uh, it depends in some ways what you mean by church in this case. I believe not that... Not the one with the cross in this That's right, that's right. Um, uh, what, you, is that what you mean by shul and state. Um, I, I believe that the fundamental and most important justica justification for Israel's existence is that this will be the one country in the world that has the protection of Jewish life as its mission statement. Uh, that it will be a refuge for Jews in distress. And therefore, I believe Israel has to fulfill that mission and should have a special obligation to the Jewish people, which it can incarnate in a preferential immigration policy for Jews. Okay, and I'm going to stop you there position, for one sec. You, I don't think you disagree with that, right? Do you disagree with anything that he, that he just said? I don't disagree, certainly, with preferential immigration over a period of or time. Or that its goal is as a protective place for... That's a too narrow definition. Instead of asking me whether I agree with him, let me state my own mm. Boy, perspective <laughs> so what does it mean at, the right, at the right time. So, so my answer is in part. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I would dismantle the chief rabbinate, which I think is one of the worst innovations in the history of Judaism. But I, just let me say, for me, part of what it means to be a Jewish state is not only a state that where the kids may get off for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and Pesach, it's the, to incarnate Jewish values. We were born as a people in slavery. Um, that one of the most frequent verses, in, uh, were, some of the most frequent word, words in the Torah are, remember that you were slaves in Egypt. And it seems to me part of what it means to be a Jewish state is to have that memory and have it inform your action. Okay. So the other question for you, and then I'll get to, get to you, Alan, is you did also say in this book a year, that came out a year ago that um, for the first time in history, many of the Jews' greatest challenges stem not from their weakness, but from their strengths. The way you just described the importance of Israel, it sounded like it was a kind of weakness-based or a fear, a concern-based uh, phenomenon. So how do you take your notion that we need to actually focus on the problems that emerge from strength and reconcile that with your um, understanding of the Israel need? Be because although a Jewish state needs to exist in the world as a place of refuge for Jews in distress, because Israel has emerged as a successful and powerful country uh, with millions of non-Jews, mostly Palestinians, living under its domain, we now face this very unusual situation in Jewish history in which we have millions of people under Jewish sovereignty. And to me, that tests the core of what it means to be a Jewish state. Because if the Jewish tradition of justice forged in powerlessness cannot survive the encounter with Jewish power, and it cannot help Israel live up to its own founding liberal democratic ideals, then Israel fails as a Jewish state. Okay. Alan, so you want to respond to that? I mean, do you, do you have a different sense of the uh, significance of, uh, of how to view Israel there? I do. Uh, first, I want to mention that uh, um, Peter, who, by the way, his book is brilliant. I really think everybody should read it. And as I said once before, read it very critically. And particularly... <laughs> You knew read, something was coming. Read the part about separation of church, mosque, synagogue, and state very critically, because Peter also, in his book, doesn't really believe in the conventional Jewish concept of separation of church and state in the United States. He believes that the yeshiva movement in America is in trouble. I agree it is. And he would like the federal government to pay for yeshivas. He would right, like but, to see... But I don't want but, to... No, but yeah. it, it responds to the point about only in Israel should there be a merger uh, of this kind. I think he, he cares more about the survival of Judaism. And frankly, uh, that's an issue that is of no concern to me um, as a lawyer and as an advocate. Uh, if Jews want to intermarry and assimilate and choose to disappear, that's an internal problem, and I might bemoan it, and maybe the world will lose something, but I'm not going to be involved in that I mean, it's controversy. Not, you don't support Israel in order to fight that um, assimilation in the world? No, I think Jews choose to assimilate. That's a question of free will, choice, and, and freedom. As well, I said, I Israel might so demone it, but I defend Israel against its external enemies, external threats. My job is to protect Israel, the nation state of the Jewish people, 
along with many other people, from external threats so that Jews can obsess about their internal problems and drive themselves crazy, as they will. I want to get back to the point where we are divided and fight among each other and have these kinds of arguments as long as the Stephen Hawkins of the world leave us alone and don't try to destroy us, and then we have our own issues. Now, Peter talks about Jewish values. I don't know what that means. Um, I am as familiar with the Torah as, as Peter is, and I can quote from all the wonderful parts uh, of, of the Torah and the wonderful parts of the, of the Talmud, uh, but I also understand that for every wonderful part of the Torah and the Talmud, there's at least one, perhaps two, God-awful parts that also represent the worst of Jewish values. So Peter doesn't really, I'm not speaking for him, but I'm speculating, doesn't really want Israel to represent Jewish values. He wants them to represent Peter's Jewish values. I would much prefer that they represent Peter's Jewish values than Meyer Kahana's Jewish values, because I like Peter's Jewish values better than I like Meyer Kahana's. But I can't tell you that Kahana's are any less authentic. So I think one of the big debates between us is I'm an externalist and Peter is an internalist. Okay, so I now, care about the external me, threats to Israel. Let me you ask care you something about, about that external point. Sure. Today, uh, in contrast to when you were a kid and the idea of Israel was still in the air and not mm -hmm. yet real, today Israel, I think it's fair to say, and let me see if you agree, is the central project of the Jewish people of the world. This, the one thing that they broadly have some link to not everyone, but if we were to choose, it certainly isn't uh, uh, some element of the religion. If that's true, and you're welcome to tell me it's not, is attacking Israel's right to exist a form of anti-Semitism today? Let me put it this way. Um, I have never met anybody except perhaps Palestinians who really give one good goddamn about the Palestinian people. The love of the Palestinian people is largely a function of the hatred of the nation state of the Jewish people. People who don't care about the Kurds, who don't care about the Armenians, who don't care about the Tibetans, who didn't give a damn about the Cambodians, who didn't say a word about the, uh, the, the people of Rwanda and the people of Darfur, suddenly have discovered the Palestinian uh, people. Um, the, the, the deep hatred that people have of Israel, I'm not talking about criticism. I was very actively involved in the anti-apartheid movement. I remember how strongly we felt about white South Africa. It didn't come close to the kind of hatred that many people feel today about Israel. Let me put it this way. Stephen Hawking would not refuse to attend a conference in a country that was equally oppressing another country, say China, and Tibet, or Russia, and Chechnya, it's all about the fact that Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people. Okay. You cannot understand the hatred of Israel if you eliminate the fact that Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people. So let me stop you is that anti-Semitism? You know, okay. you, you name address it. This in I'm your describing book, it. So, yeah. do you, actually, that's not what you say. No, right? so, I, I agree with Alan that there is disproportionate criticism of Israel but you don't given think that's the scale Jewish. of the human rights abuses. But there are other explanations for why there is disproportionate criticism. The, the, that part of the world, the Holy Land, happens to be a place that a lot of people care a lot about, more than many of them for their own religious reasons, Christians or Muslims, more than they care about Burma. There are a lot of Americans who care because America, is, as, as, which gives Israel $3 billion a year, is much more deeply invested in supporting Israel's policies than it is invo involved in supporting the policies of many other dictatorial governments. I also think, and this goes back to the South Africa point, there, on the left, there is a long tradition of judging more harshly Western regimes than non-Western regimes. I'm not defending that tradition. I think it's a blind spot of the West, OK? I think it's, it's part of the West's moral blind spot. But you could see it in South Africa. Again, I'm not saying Israel is the same as South Africa. But South Africa was not the worst human rights abuser in the world at that time. It was not even the worst human rights abuser in Africa at that time. So why did it get so much attention? Because there is this tendency in the, po the post-colonial third world to focus on things that look like Western imperialism and a focus in Europe history 
history, a tendency in Europe to do the same thing. So is there anti-Semitism that motivates hostility to Israel, disproportionate focus? Absolutely. But if you think it's only anti-Semitism, you're not going to know how to respond to it effectively, because it's actually a lot more complicated than that. And the proof of the pudding is that the dirty little secret of the anti-Israel movement, of the people who don't want there to be a Jewish state, who want there to be a secular binational state or whatever, is a huge percentage of them are Jews. So, so, so that, Jewish anti-Semitism yes, is but as, if, as, as if, old if as history. If the animating principle of that movement were hostility to Jews per se, I don't think it would be so easy for so many of its most active members to be Jews. But how do you, feel, how do you feel about the argument that if you <laughs> attack the existence of the state, not its actions, not its policies, not its occupation, the idea of a Jewish state, that that is a contemporary version of anti-Semitism. So, Are problem, you comfortable Ethan, with no, that but idea? No, because the problem is that Israel has never defined what it means to be a Jewish state. Israel has never even defined what it means to be a Jew very effectively. Israel has no constitution. So if, you, if I say, I think Israel's uh, national anthem, Hatikva, which talks about Nefesh Yehudi, the Jewish soul, well, that's not very good because it's Arab-Israeli citizens. They don't have a Jewish soul. So maybe they should change it to the Israeli soul. Mm -hmm. Are you negating Israel's existence? Um, if you want to the point is that to, to answer the question, to, to try to figure out whether someone wants to negate Israel's existence, you have to first come up with a definition of what makes Israel Israel. I've said that for me, the fundamental core definition of, of a Jewish state for me has to be the, that Israel has takes responsibility for Jews around the world in distress. So I think the conversation about whether you want to negate the existence can only take place once you've actually defined what makes Israel a Jewish state in the first place. I don't think we'll ever succeed in defining what makes Israel a Jewish state any more than we'll ever succeed in defining what is the essence of Judaism. If you asked a thousand Jews, if a pollster had asked a thousand Jews, in the year zero or 100 BC, what is the essence of Judaism? They'd all have a very simple answer. Of course, who would doubt it? Animal sacrifices. <laughs> of course, animal sacrifices are the essence of Judaism. Look at the Torah. The whole book of Vayikra is full of animal sacrifices. Much of Bamidbor. An Judaism without animal sacrifices? Unthinkable, inconceivable. The idea that you can define what is the essence of Judaism or what is the essence of the Jewish state? What is the essence of the Jewish people? That's why I use a much more descriptive term. Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people, the nation state of people from Theodor Herzl, who has never been in the inside of a synagogue, to Achad Am, who tried to rebuild kind of Jewish literary tradition, to uh, David Ben-Gurion, who was a fervent atheist who loved the Bible. Uh, you can't define a common well, Jewish, let, let uh, uh, a and, and Israel will exist beyond the scope of our ability to define it in a narrow reductionistic way. Meanwhile, I don't think, my sense is that your desire to define it as a, as a refuge for Jews in trouble is getting old, because there aren't too many Jews left out there in trouble. I mean, all the Jews are basically there or here, and it's not a very troubled population, right? So, in other words, it seems to me that it, it's safe to call it a refuge for Jews in trouble, but that's kind of, we're, we're moving beyond that moment, it seems to me. Well, I, we don't know. I mean, there are Jews, moving, there are Jews leaving Israel, there have been Jews leaving Israel in, from France in the last few years. Okay. I mean, I, I think that, I think. 2,000 or something. Yeah, I mean, not a, really not, no, well, not a huge annoying? number, but in fact, I mean, they're, 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 I think the point is that I think that given the long scope of Jewish history, um, uh, it, is, to be there. it is, it is, it is a little arrogant for us to say that because at this particular moment we don't see the group of Jews who need it that we can give up on the idea. No, I'm not saying to give it up, but I'm saying that to rely on it as the core mission, it's sort of a little bit easy because really there are so many other things to deal with right now and that is not a central issue right this minute. But let me ask you something else, Peter, which is this, because I think this is where you guys differ. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the hostility to Israel stems essentially from what it is or from what it does, okay? In I, other words, yes. is it because it's policy and it's occupation yes. or because it's very existent? The, the answer is both. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have never met a Palestinian who was happy that Israel was created. Every Palestinian I've ever met uh, uh, thinks that Israel's creation was a his historical tragedy for the Palestinians and they believe it's racist, colonialist, imperialist, ethnic cleansing, every bad word you can trot out. Right? So I think that's true. And I think the people on the left who try to deny that are, are silly. It, it, that is true. But I think it's also important to acknowledge that there are many Palestinians, 
uh, and many in the broader Arab and Muslim world, you can see it in the Arab Peace Initiative, who have come to say that they can accept Israel's existence within certain borders, not because they're happy that it was created, not because they get excited when they hear Hatikva and they love Zionism, but because they don't want their children and grandchildren to die in more wars trying to destroy it when they don't think they can win. I and what I think is absolutely <laughs> crucial for those of us who love Israel is that we act to strengthen those forces among the Palestinians and the Arabs and the Muslims and weaken those who are willing to fight for a thousand years until we're all dead. And this Israeli government is doing the opposite. And that's what bothers me. Well, I agree with everything you said up until the very last term, because <laughs> when you say this Israeli government, let's remember too, Israeli governments are not like U.S. governments. The United States government is Barack Obama. Whatever he says goes. If he gets a, f in terms, in terms of executive authority, we'll get to the legislature. That's right. okay. We'll get to the legislature in a minute. From your mouth to God's ears. But if John Kerry looks at him funny, he's out. If any cabinet member in any way undercuts him, that's the end. We have the strongest executive in the history of any nation state. In Israel, the cabinet consists of. People who hate the prime minister are trying to get his job, who are reluctantly there because of the insane coalition politics that has been foisted upon Israel by the multi-party system and by the impossibility of ever reforming a system from within, because you can try from outside, but you have to do it from within, and everybody always has a, a stake in the outcome. So when you say the Israeli government policy, um, I know what Netanyahu would do if he had the power to do it alone. He you doesn't do? have the power to do that. I you think do I know? do. I know him very well. I've known him for 40 years. Um, I think I know what the former foreign minister of Israel would do if he had the power. Um, I think I know what Sipi Livni would do, uh, what Ehud Barak would do. Um, but I don't know what the Israeli government policy is. Uh, I think that Bibi Netanyahu would love to have the statue of him in Jerusalem as the man who brought about the two-state solution, brought about peace, kept Jerusalem united, did a variety of things that are impossible but, but, to do in a reconcilable way. But I think to say that Israel is doing exactly, the Israeli government is doing exactly the opposite. First of all, today's Israeli government is not doing anything very different from what the labor government did. In fact, although were I an Israeli, I'd be a person of the left and voting the left, I think the biggest problems that Israel caused, and I don't think Peter's going to disagree with me on this, were caused by the labor government. Well, that I mean, is, you weren't okay. arguing that this government as opposed okay. to the let, one that let, Let's not talk about what Benjamin right. Netanyahu right. might want to do or what he told Alan he would want to do. Let's look at what he's... Let's look at what he's done. No, let's look okay. at what let's the look, government okay, has done. Okay, let's look at what his government has done, because right. he's been in power since the beginning of 2009. Right. Last November, his finance minister, Yuval Steinitz, boasted that they had doubled funding for settlements. The, the, there was a big report by the business supplement of, the, of Yedio Rachronot last summer, which found that the five most heavily subsidized cities in Israel, subsidized by the government, are all in the West Bank. They're all Jewish cities in the West Bank, and the most heavily subsidized Jewish mun municipality in the state of Israel is the radical Jewish settlement in Hebron, which gets seven times as much government money as the large, poor, historically Mizrahi city of Beersheba in the Negev. That's the policy of this Israeli government. The policy of this Israeli government was when Barack Obama talked, uh, t gave a speech talking about 1967 lines plus swaps. He didn't even say equal swaps, by the way. He just said swaps, which was the principle that had been accepted by Ehud Olmert in his negotiations, that Bibi rushed on a plane, came in front of the White House, and basically told Joe Barack Obama to jump in the lake. He, this is also the prime minister who, when Mahmoud Abbas said he renounced his own, desire, he renounced his own claim on spot, as a refugee, Benjamin Netanyahu basically said it's not important. And now with the Arab League re-offering their initiative, basically Netanyahu is again, to the dismay of many Israelis, since not said anything positive in return. So let's look at what he's done. Okay, but, but you know, he's ac actually, ap no, he's, uh, Netanyahu is 100% right on the issue of the 67 lines with swaps. Not only that, but Barack Obama now agrees with him. Let me explain why. Um, in, if you start with the 67 borders and then have swaps, here's the way you begin. You begin with the Palestinians owning the Kotel, the Western Wall, owning the Jewish Quarter, owning the access road to Hebrew University, 
um, owning the Latrun corridor, owning the areas that make Israel eight kilometers or eight miles wide at its belly, and then you ask the Israelis to make land swaps with the Palestinians. Now, I discussed this with both Fayyad and Abbas, and they both had the same answer. We'll do land swaps, but as Fayyad put it to me, you're a smart lawyer, Dershowitz, you know that in real estate, the only thing that's important is location, location, location. What do you think the Kotel and the area around the Kotel, which is about one acre, what do you think that's worth? 10,000 acres in the north? 20,000 acres in the north? When you start an exchange of land with the Palestinians, having everything 67 in total violation of Security Council Resolution 242, in total violation of what everybody believed the peace treaty was between, the unilateral peace treaty, of course, between Israel and its enemies after the 67 war, you're inviting absolute disaster. You cannot start with the 67 lines. Well, you is, can the argument was to start with is, as a basis. You can't, how can you start with that as a basis? What does that mean? Does it mean the Palestinians have the Kotel, or doesn't it? Look, does it mean they have the access road to the Hebrew University, or doesn't it? I think it leaves if it you ambiguous. can't no. agree on land okay. swaps, but it's you know the 67 lines. I, I, and I, I that's wanna, unacceptable. I want to ask you something else. Yeah. Because I don't. But ask Peter that. Does he? Does he think the six? I, if we think, end with the sixty-seven lines, is that a good no, thing? No, I don't want to end with the sixty-seven it's lines. But with all due respect, begin. this is this is all nonsense. The, the the point is, is there going to be a Palestinian state which is viable, which to be viable has to be on 95% plus of the I West Bank. There will be, everyone knows there's going to be a special regime for the tiny little area of the old city oh. in, which, in which all kinds of different formulas have been talked about at how you deal with the Temple Mount and the Western Wall. The basic question is that Benjamin Netanyahu and many on the Israeli right have basically have a vision in which Israel controls Area C. That's 50, that's 60% or 50% of the West Bank. And then you basically say, if you want to take these disconnected cantons on 40% of the West Bank and call it a state, you can call it an empire for all we care. Then why did the Palestinians turn down 93 to 95% when offered by Ehud Barak, 96% because, okay, when offered by because, Ehud because, Olmert? Because they because, had an opportunity because people to accept like you, that. Because Alan, if I want to sell you my house, yeah. and you say, you're, uh, and I say it's worth a million dollars, and you say no, you've rejected my offer. If you say, I'm going to, willing to pay $500,000, and I say, no, I've rejected your offer. No. What people like you keep leaving out in these narratives is that the Palestinians also had offers. The, Israel re the Palestinians rejected Israel's offer. Israel rejected the Palestinians' offer. Not Gilad Sher, Gilad Sher, who was Barack's chief negotiator at Camp David, says that Arafat had an offer for about a 2.5% land swap, international troops in the Jordan Valley, Jewish control over the Jewish neighborhoods of East, of East Jerusalem. We know that, that Saab Arakat has said that when Omer offered 6.3% with a 5.7% land swap, that Abbas offered a 1.9% equal land swap. So you can't simply tell the story as the Palestinians saying no. The truth is, there was a difference in the amount in the amount of land they wanted the Palestinians to take control of. There were differences on refugees, differences on other issues as well. That's why building settlements is so catastrophic, because well, it makes the possibility but, but the of bridging those divides actually, that much harder. We never disagree. agree on this. No, we do disagree no, on this, because not the not other people... Yeah, well, Who are Bill, the other people? Bill Clinton, uh, Dennis Ross, yeah. have a completely no, different narrative. They say Alan, that Yasser Arafat no. walked away without making a counter offer. But, Alan, now, with, all the, the, yeah. with all respect, those are the only people you've read. Yeah. If, you, if you actually read the literature more broadly, you would see that actually there are a whole, there are a series of Israeli negotiators, from Yossi Balin to Gilad Sher, and including they Americans. They all have an agenda, no. and they're uh, everybody all, has, everybody they're has, all everybody creating has narratives that every, fit their agenda. Everybody, Everybody and I'm has, saying to you, an everybody we'll has never an resolve this. Okay. Yes, we'll yes. never Everyone resolve has an what happened. Uh, look, I want to make clear: I am not absolving Yasser Arafat from a significant share of the blame for what happened at Camp David or Jimmy and Carter, Taba or Jimmy Carter, who told Yasser Arafat to turn down. The okay, you want to throw Carter Carter's. in there too? But the point, the point is that the point is there was a difference in there was a difference between the two parties, and simply saying that it was a story of Israel offering the moon and the Palestinians saying no and offering nothing in return is simply not it true is to true. the historical record. No, it is true, Martin, and it's true in '67 when Israel accepted 242, Alan, there's a huge and the Palestinians on this. went to Khartoum and said no negotiations, no peace, no, no recognition. Let me, let me just one quote. Listen to this. I want to listen to this. This is this is for 
Barack's former aide, Tal Zipperstein. Ten years later, this is what he said in 2011, there are still people who say we gave them everything at Camp David and got nothing. That is a flagrant lie. This was another Barack aide who has come out and said, in fact, that this is a distortion so of the historical record. So I actually spoke to Tal Zipperstein days after this was over, and I got a completely different okay. account well, we from don't have a record of that. than the this one a, that he has okay. written this years is, later. What happens is people rewrite history according to their ideology. My point is we'll never know for sure what happened, but if you look from, 48, from 38 on, 38 two-state solution, 48 two-state solution, Israel accepts it, Palestinians more, reject it, 67, okay. Okay, 92, 2001, okay, 2007, it's a consistent pattern. You can find a quote or two that seems inconsistent with that, but you can't deny the pattern. What are, which, which, which leader, uh, Mahmoud Abbas or Benjamin Netanyahu, rejected Barack, uh, uh, Barack Obama's proposal for 67 lines plus swaps? And which one, I which one, signed, I which one signed the Dershowitz deal? Right? You have your peace plan, yeah. right? As far as I saw a picture in the Jerusalem Post of Abbas's signature on it. Absolutely. Where's BB's signature? Well, BB didn't turn it down. Well. Oh, he didn't turn it down. <laughs> Remember no, he thing? didn't turn it down. You offered it last fall. What's he waiting for? I mean, you all well, Steinitz turned that. it down last week in Say front again? of you. Steinitz said no to you. Steinitz said no, it. and so did uh, Uzi Arad. Right. But I have to tell you that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, I think, would very... First of all, Benjamin Netanyahu responded by saying, let's have negotiations without any preconditions. And having negotiations without any preconditions, it seems to me, is the right approach. Yeah, but you're saying once you start, you freeze. And that's, that's right. what you're demanding. And he's not he said, not yes, said to yes to that. I wish, I wish he had said I yes to it. That. I now, agree with you. the opportunity, and him or Abbas. Uh, really look, both. Now, now I, I don't know whether Abbas, I, we, what we don't know is whether if Netanyahu accepted that, Abbas would stick with it. We just don't know. Let's, I'm agreeing right, with you. We that's required, ought to try it. I am critical of this government for not, and I've said it over and over again in writing, that the Israeli government should be more generous, should start the negotiations, but I think the Palestinians have to come to the table. Remember this, Israel won the West Bank in a completely legitimate defensive yep. war, and it's entitled, under international law and practice, not to end a military occupation until there is peace. 242 said, Israel no, should we return. We this. We don't. You we don't, don't, but you just need 30 seconds <laughs> to make the Ten. point. Ten. You really don't need Until it. I mean, there is peace and this. recognized boundaries, Israel is not obliged to return territories. Israel has complied with 242. With every country it made peace with, Egypt and Jordan, it gave them back every inch of land. Well, it is no, it prepared. didn't. It yes, really it did. did. What but didn't it give uh, back? Uh, uh, Gaza back to Egypt didn't give it back everything. It wanted to give it back. They didn't take it but back. But you said it gave back every piece of land. They, they said, take it. And <laughs> right. And in fact, in fact, Begin didn't even want to accept the Camp David Accords yeah, this until Egypt <laughs> took it back, and Jimmy Carter forced him not to give it back. Okay. If that doesn't constitute you've, you've giving it back, I don't now, know listen, what listen, does. Listen, right. it, fine. Uh, it does, there is a difference in emphasis on who is more at fault historically between the two of you, fine. Hmm. But there is not fundamentally a difference about that they're both, that there are flaws in both sides. Absolutely. Okay, fine. Now. As we move forward, and on the settlements, as we move we agree. For, and on the settlements, you agree. Now, as we right. move forward, how do you feel about the demand by the Israeli government that the Palestinians declare Israel to be a Jewish state? They don't. Here's the issue, and it's very, very clear, and this has been stated publicly over and over and over again as recently as last week. Benjamin Netanyahu has said. The Palestinians do not have to recognize Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people in order to sit down and negotiate. It is not a precondition to negotiation. He didn't say it was a he precondition said, to negotiation, but it's a he precondition doesn't think, to a deal. He doesn't think there will be a deal unless that happens. So that's now, what I'm asking. Okay, you. let me explain why I think that's right. Okay. It was right not to demand that of Egypt. It was right not to demand that of Jordan. And they made peace with Jordan and Egypt without demanding that they recognize Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people. It's very different with the Palestinian authorities because by failing to do that, they are implicitly including the right of return. What they're saying is, we're not going to tell you that we accept Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people because we think that millions of Palestinians have the right to go back and become full citizens of Israel. I believe, this is my prediction, that if the Palestinian Authority were to 
a compromise on the, on the right of return and accept the symbolic right of return, 20,000, 30,000, 50,000 people, and give up any universal right of return, then the demand for recognizing Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people would weaken and probably dissipate. I do not believe that is the ultimate barrier to peace, and I don't think that that would be a condition of any final negotiation, but it's certainly, we all agree here, that it's not a condition for sitting down and renewing negotiations. The no, and but, the but, question down, then but. that I throw to Peter and to you too is why won't the Palestinians sit down and negotiate with no preconditions now? Okay, I'm not here to defend the Palestinians mm -hmm. or you. So my, let me ask you, are you troubled by the demand or do you think it's an appropriate one? Again, not as a precondition for sitting down, but as an assertion that there can't really be a two-state solution unless you guys see us as a Jewish state or the homeland of the Jewish people. No, I think this is a, an obstacle to concluding a deal that Netanyahu has thrown up in large part because he doesn't want to have to face the political consequences of what would happen if he so got So you think it's a deal. cynical demand? Yeah, I do. He doesn't because actually it was not believe emphasized, It was not emphasized like this by his predecessors. Look, if the issue is refugees, talk about refugees. There's a huge amount of work that's been done on refugees. We have, so we have some reporting, for instance, that at the, near, in the Omerta Abbas negotiations, that the Palestinians offered, final offer was for Israel to accept 150,000 refugees. Now, that's more than the 20 or 30,000 that Alan said, but just in terms of the demographic character of Israel, you would lose more Palestinians by giving back East Jerusalem to a Palestinian state than you would take. So if you want to have this talkless conversation about how many that. refugees, have that conversation. I agree. That's the fine. We don't, there's no need for the Palestinians. You have to resolve the, re the refugee question, but you don't have to tell the Palestinians that they have to accept Israel as a Jewish state. They just just have to accept Israel. Israel can call itself whatever it wants. No, I don't, I don't ultimately disagree with that. Um, I do think that, remember that also, and this is, this is a much more difficult question. Netanyahu has now said that uh, any peace agreement would require a referendum. And as you know, Tal Silberstein was sitting with Ehud Barak every day and doing literally instant polling to see how far Barak could go without losing the election. Turned out he lost the election in any event. But in a democracy, unlike the Palestinian Authority or Hamas also talking or about Jordan, a referendum, Alan. Uh, I understand that, but it's a different kind of referendum. Uh, one is but, but a real... I, yeah. I, I want to challenge you a little but, but bit a on this idea. Can, not on the Might benefit from the Palestinians being willing to say the words nation state of the Jewish people. It might help you the know, referendum can I just prevail. Say there, look, let me, let me offer an easy compromise. There's nothing wrong, actually. I think you could solve this problem by saying we recognize it as a, a nation state of the Jewish people, Jewish state, without prejudice to the democratic rights of all its citizens. Yes, but that. they are not offering to do that. I agree with no, that. I You're it, offering them, but they're not offering. No, and but so I what think, I'm asking you mm -hmm. is why doesn't it bother you more that they're not offering? Because, okay, the, the, because the, the Palestinians, problem, the Palestinians, if it turns out, if it yes. turns out that decades of efforts have actually gotten nowhere, the argument from the right is the reason it's gotten nowhere is actually they don't get that this is the, what we want. They still think the Jews are a religion, that it's a big Western European thing. All of that talk is still quite common. But it doesn't. It doesn't Does it ultimately, it doesn't matter what Palestinians think Judaism is, just as it doesn't matter whether they think Zionism is a legitimate enterprise. The issue is, the, real, the difficult issue is, that 20% that of the Israeli citizenry inside the Green Line are what we've, Jews have historically called Arab Israelis, but are essentially Palestinian citizens of Israel. Mm -hmm. The problem that Israel has to deal with is that those people don't want, those Palestinian citizens don't want Israel to be a Jewish state because they don't feel like their sons and daughters can grow up and think and aspire to be prime minister because they're not Jews. They don't get excited looking at a flag that looks like a talus and has a mug and David on it. And that, that problem, you can't ask the Palestinian leadership, which is going to create a state in the West Bank and Gaza, to make that problem go away. It won't go away. Israel is going to have to find a way of finding its own identity within its original borders in a way that can be more inclusive Peter, of those Palestinian we were both citizens. furious when people like Golda Meir would announce over and over again there are no Palestinian people, Palestine is just Jordan, there already is a Palestinian state. I mean, that's a terrible thing to say, to deny people their peoplehood. And I have said and you're since 1967 that. that the Palestinian people are a legitimate people, they have a right to peoplehood, they have a right to nationhood, and I think Israel should say that. And I think the Palestinians should say 
that Israel has the right to nationhood as the nation state of the Jewish people with full and complete complete yeah. Look, democratic if, rights I don't, of if, all if other you people make it, who live If you there. make it clear that it's not it's without prejudice to the rights of all of Israel's citizens, yeah. Jewish and non-Jewish, I don't have a problem And by the way, all. on right. Hatikva, when, when, I, and I, well, we don't know. Canada, we don't know. When Canada, think, when Canada takes the cross out of its national anthem, when virtually every European country takes Christianity out of their, quote, secular national anthems, We'll get online and we'll get to Israel and maybe Israel will change to Nefesh Israeli. I said that same thing in my book in defending the idea that you can have a democratic Jewish state. I, I agree, but there are practical things that Israel has to do in order to make its own Palestinian citizens, who its own government commission, the Or Commission, said suffer discrimination and neglect to feel them more truly but part Peter, of the state. Do, okay, you now think, do you think, I just want to ask Peter one question, do you think that Israel has 20%, as you know, of Palestinian Arabs. Would it be such a terrible thing if uh, the state of Palestine had 20% or 10% N not at all. Jewish population? No. And would you insist that Palestine not have the crescent in its flag? I, I'm not insisting I mean, that Israel not have the Magid David. What I'm saying like is, what I'm say I, look, I love the idea of Jews living in the, in the West Bank. I can read Bereshit as well as anyone else. I understand that people might want to live near Hebron or Shechem or Beit Lechem or places that are historically very important to the Jewish people. Beit Lechem is in, is in Israel the last time I looked, right? What? No, he's, so, oh, he's you talking about in the Beit West Bank. Beit Lechem, West Bethlehem, Bethlehem right. is, in, is, okay. is in the West Bank. Right. The issue is not Jews living there. The issue is Jews living under a different law than their Palestinian neighbors. If okay. Jews are willing to live under the same law, which means they cannot have religiously and ethnically exclusive communities, it means if a Palestinian wants to go and buy a house in Kiryat Arba or Ariel, they have the right to do that, then by all means. You think Israelis today have the right to live in small Arab communities uh, in, uh, in, in the Afula Triangle? I mean, the tragedy is that today in Israel and on the West Bank, there are exclusive Jewish and exclusive Arab neighborhoods. That's, that's way, a big problem, and that's the way both sides want it. For that's moment, not for sure. segregation or apartheid. That's an unfortunate reality as to the way things happen. Now, in the let West me ask Bank you something the, else, right. Al. The question of whether Zionism is in crisis mm -hmm. underlying this discussion, how long can the occupation go on? And you feel that Zionism has a future? Well, first of all, there are two occupations, and let's be very clear about that. There's a military occupation, and there are the settlements. And they are completely different. Their status is completely different in international law. I, right from the beginning in 67, was a strong supporter of the Alon Plan. What was the Alon Plan? The Alon Plan required that Israel would annex, actually, parts of the West Bank as military, appropriate military response to a defensive war but it would not create civilian settlements. So I'm in favor of a continued military occupation of parts of the West Bank until there's real peace. I think Israel made a mistake in ending the military occupation of Gaza. So let me ask and, you differently. And How it long didn't can make the a mistake. stand there? I think they should, I, look, I think, I, if I had my way, if I'm I had my way, way, I would not have permitted Malaya Dumim I and Gilo. Malaya Dumim and Gilo are a reality. But They're going to stay. But what I'm asking you not is not did you not favor right. them, but how serious an issue is it? Because it's one thing to say, look, it happened and we'll have to live with it. It's another thing to say, everything that Israel is supposed so to stand for is challenged you by its continued no, existence. No, not, not so. That's what Peter uh, said. Well, I, I, first of all, I don't think Peter believes that. I don't think Peter okay. believes that. Israel's existence as a Jewish nation is challenged by Malay Adumim and Gilo continuing to be, in fact, he's written that, continuing to be part of Israel as part, yeah, of, as part of land swaps, as part of an agreed upon it's resolution. Now, there are hard issues. The Ariel block, the Etzion block, to my mind, there ought to be land swaps that as much as possible, the areas that are within the security barrier of Israel ought to be exchanged for areas in the north of Israel. There should be, in my mind, equal land swaps. I favor completely equal land swaps. But the reality on the ground is you're not going to move. It would be much easier to end the occupation and to create a two-state solution realistically in Israel if you don't have to dismantle the very large near Jerusalem settlement blocks. But you still got 90,000 people. Having said that, I would abolish immediately all the settlements outside of the security area, all the unlawful settlements, all the new settlements, all of that. Do you imagine it's still that. doable? 
Absolutely. Until, for, until how long? I think, it's, I think that John Ten Kerry makes a terrible mistake when he says that there is a time limit on that. I think, look, Israel proved, everybody said that we would never be able to have an evacuation of the Gaza, even though there are only nine to 10,000 people. It happened, it was difficult. Israel screwed it up to a fairly well. It treated the people who left Gaza horribly. It sent a terrible message to the people on the West Bank that we will treat you horribly too if you leave. If they had only really done a good job in evacuating the Gaza, I think it would be much easier for them okay. to evacuate the West Bank. But I think it's doable. I do not think the settlements are the major barrier to peace, though they are a barrier. Peter? We won't know until Israel tries. Right. But uh, what really worries me uh, in the Jewish community is the sense of complacency that you can continue, again, to continue to massively subsidize more and more people to move to the West Bank and think that basically the deal is still always going to be there for the end of the day. 9,000 settlers, first that was the biggest Israeli military operation since the Yom Kippur War, to remove 9,000 settlers from a place of Gaza which is not nearly as biblically significant as is the West Bank. Everyone agrees that you're basically talking about at least 100,000 settlers from the West Bank now and, and, and in a situation in which those communities have become much more deeply entrenched in the military than they were before. You have, a, you have, you have settlements like Ariel, which are 20,000 people. They now have a full-fledged university there. Bibi called it the heart of our country. It is not compatible with a contiguous, viable Palestinian state, as even Shlomo Ben-Ami, Barack's foreign minister, has acknowledged. Efrat is considered one of the most consensus settlements in Israel. The Palestinians cannot accept it because it sits right on Route 60, which is the main north-south artery. That's not even to mention the, the potential of moving into E1, which this Israeli government has been moving forward on, according to reports, which would basically sever East Jerusalem from the rest of the West Bank. The Omer government also uh, favored uh, 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 adapting Well, E1. then shame on them, but at least they were negotiating towards a deal seriously. The point is that there is, it is not hard to imagine a situation, even if you look at polling, polling still shows Palestinians favor by a small margin the two-state solution over one-state solution, but they don't believe the two-state solution will ever happen because of settlement growth. What you're doing is you're pushing Palestinians towards going for the one-state option en masse, and once they do that en masse, there will be a tipping point that we can't recover from. If Palestinians en masse start demanding Israeli citizenship in a secular binational state, Israel will have no answer for that. The world will ultimately get behind them, and it will be the end of the Zionist project? Well, I just don't agree. I think that um, it would be far better if uh, the Palestinians were to accept a piece of the kind that was offered by Olmert, which included the major settlement blocks, many of them remaining within Israel, carving out around the security barrier, uh, accepting the reality on the ground, which was unfortunate, but put there by the labor government as much as by the right-wing governments having major land exchanges, which would give, and here's a real problem for, for Israel and for democracy, many areas in the north of Israel around the Afula Triangle are populated 98% by, by Palestinian Israelis, um, uh, but 82 or 83%, according to polls, uh, don't want to become part of a Palestinian state, even if they're given that option. They want to remain Israelis. Now, that may change if a Palestinian state is successful and viable and economically uh, effective, but right now, even the land swaps are difficult, and it's not because of the settlements alone, it's because what are you going to swap? What is Israel? You but can't just swap that's land. Precisely, you that's have to swap precisely land the, that has people on see, it. See, this is precisely the problem. Israel doesn't have very much land to swap. It, Once you start going above 2, 3, 4 percent, there is no high quality land that doesn't do have people on it. So you're either going to have to be moving people permission. against their uh, will inside Israel in order to accommodate all the land that you need to take in the West Bank. It's, this is why it's a very, very difficult proposition, and, which we should not be making worse by continuing to subsidize. Settlement okay. I'm not sure it's not, being made anywhere. So remember, the settlement, settlement building, so for the no most part, there. is building up, not out. The settlement building, for the most part, are taking existing settlements and uh, increasing their depth. I oppose all that, but I think it's a mistake to think that that has been uh, the barrier to peace. Remember, peace was not coming in 64 and 65 and 55. Okay. There was no peace before 67. 
and there are many other barriers right. to peace. They're basically, you think that the bigger problems are external, not internal. I do. Right. I do. I understand. Right. And that's just largely the difference between you. Do you think, Peter, that in the name of a two-state solution, American policy should be to encourage Hamas Fatah reconciliation? I think that Israel is already negotiating with Hamas. Of course. Um, uh, that, that's the way we ended the Gaza war, was the Israeli negotiation with Hamas. That's not you, the same thing. No, it's not. But, the, but, but the, the point is that Hamas, as much as one, uh, I think it's a vile movement that is doing terrible things to the Palestinians in Gaza, exists. And Israel is not going to destroy it as a movement. We can politically weaken it by strengthening those Palestinians who are willing to accept the idea of a two-state solution. But for, a Palestinian, for the Palestinians to be able to be the most legitimate negotiating partner they can be, there, has to, there needs to be Palestinian democracy. There need to be elections in the West Bank and Gaza. And I do favor a Palestinian unity government that can, uh, that can be the beginning uh, the, of, of moving towards those elections. Right. Otherwise, you have a Palestinian view. I have, I have a completely, like I have a completely different view. It's, this is going to take a, a, maybe more than 30 seconds. Okay. But wh why is Israel moving to the right? Israel is moving to the right because Peter and I devoted our lives to trying to save Soviet Jewry, and we were very successful. I spent all of the 70s in the Soviet Union going back and forth, negotiating the release of many dissidents and Jews. And so the Jews from the Soviet Union came to Israel and became right-wingers. To be because fair, I spent the 70s in elementary school, but, okay. I, but I was... Um, but you, uh, were, you I, wrote in your book. But I, you but I, your I book. was very inspired by the work you did. Uh, and you wrote in your book that you <laughs> no, were I mean that. very much part of that movement. And so, you know, there's no free lunch in a democracy. Uh, you bring people in, that's part of what Israel is supposed to do. We saved a million Soviet Jews, and what did they do? They built settlements because they, Israel is a democracy. The same thing is going to be uh, true uh, in, uh, in, in, in Israel now as well. Uh, you know, ha Hamas, we want a democracy. So there's going to be a democracy, and there's going to be a vote. And the vote will be never to recognize Israel under any circumstances, and to do everything to destroy Israel, and to reaffirm the Hamas Charter. I mean, that's democracy. 1932 was democracy in Germany. Democracy is not a guarantee of a good outcome. And so the result may very well be a more democratic Palestine and a Palestine that will make it much, much harder to make peace, just as Israel has had a more democratic Israel, and that democratic Israel has pushed to the right. So democracy in the end may be a barrier to peace. That is a tragic reality of the real world. I'll never forget, you're going to accuse me but of name dropping you... again, and I plead guilty. I'll never forget a conversation that I had with, with Bill Clinton about this when he was president. We were sitting in the home of somebody having dinner in Martha's Vineyard. I think maybe your in-laws were even uh, there with us, and, or your, 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 your mother and her husband were there with us. And a guy started attacking the uh, Israeli government's policies. And Bill Clinton responded by saying, you don't understand. It's so easy to negotiate for me to deal with Jordan. Just call King Hussein, do it, or I'll cut off funding. Call Mubarak, do it. You can't do that with Israel. He said it, this is exactly Bill Clinton's words. Israel is a democracy, damn it. <laughs> and that's the truth. And it's very hard. People say democracies don't make war with each other. Democracies also find it harder to make peace because you need consensus, and, so, and it's a very difficult reality that we're facing. And so, but do you, so where do you come down on this idea of Hamas Fatah reconciliation? I understand there's a risk there. On the other hand, Peter's point that unless you have a, a, some kind of unified polity, what are you going to negotiate with? What do you, how do you view it? I did not favor reconciliation between the democratic governments of Spain in the 1930s and the king monarchist king of Spain. It depends on who you're negotiating with. I do not want to see an end result, which is a Palestinian authority that is devoted to the destruction of Israel. Right. Frankly, I care less about whether P Palestine is a democracy than I do about whether Palestine is willing to make peace with Israel. So that's my first priority. Democracy, again, that's Palestine's problem, but I'm not whether asking, they want to be a I'm democracy. Talk, I'm talking about I care about whether they want to make peace with Israel. That's what I'm talking about. Right. I'm not asking you from the welfare of the Palestinians. I'm asking you, you want to cut a deal for your Jewish state. Is right. it helpful or not helpful? At the moment, it's not helpful. At the moment, it would be much better for Israel to make a deal with the Palestinian Authority 
not to empower Hamas to overthrow the uh, Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. Uh, look, you can ask the same question about Syria. What's the outcome I wish for in Syria? Do I want the rebels to win? Do I want the butcher Assad uh, 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 to win? These are very complicated problems, and we cannot solve them by kind of slogans, bumper stickers, or simple-minded resolutions in favor of democracy and in favor of Arab Spring and in favor of this. We have to look at the real politique of what's going on, but and it's very complex and unpredictable. We're going to yeah. talk for another four, four or five minutes, and then I'm going to have you guys I just want questions. to say one small thing. I think defining Palestinian politics as Mahmoud Abbas against the leaders of Hamas misses something really important. The, I think the question is, does Israel want to make, want to make peace with, with, with leaders who have legitimacy in their own population because there are democratic processes or not? And Alan's right. There are risks to that. There are huge risks to that. There was a big risk when, when, the, when the Egyptians voted. They were, voted for the worst possible candidate in, in, in Morsi. But it's a mistake to see that as only Hamas and, and Fatah for this particular reason. The most popular Palestinian leader is Marwan Barghouti, who's right. been in jail for many, many years. If you really wanted to have elections and have the most powerful, credible Palestinian leader, I don't think it would be Abbas or Khalid Mashal. And I think the question Israel has to, has to answer, ask, ask itself is, does it want Palestinian leaders who have the democratic legitimacy to be able to make really tough decisions? It's true. There are no guarantees. There are no guarantees. But ultimately, Israel will be better off if it doesn't have Palestinian leaders who it itself makes look like puppets because they don't have because they, they don't have the democratic legitimacy that comes from voting amongst the Palestinians. I think you're right. On the other hand, there is, there is an issue right now in the atmosphere of the last two and a half years in the region, which is that you know one side could well overwhelm the other in the Palestinian political uh, ferment right yes, now. Yes, and that's why I think that, you need there's to. There's the risk. Right, it's a phase. it's a risk, and that's why I think what you need to do at the same time is pursue policies that show right. that the, that Palestinian leaders who do support the two state solution can deliver. I, I, I don't disagree with that, and I think that Israel missed opportunities with Fayyad, and yet it was the Palestinians who got rid of Fayyad not the Israelis who got rid of Fayyad. He resigned. Because he he was resigned. Not, well, but he was not popular because he was seen as too Western. He was seen as too pro-Israel, too pro-economic growth. Uh, again, more complex. And I think we ought to eschew kind of simple-minded blame Israel for everything or blame the Palestinians for everything. There's enough fault to go around. But the most important point is this is so much more complex than most arguments and debates make it out to be. And what we need is wise leadership. And I'm not sure that we have the wisest leadership in terms of any of the participants here. We need wise leadership prepared to make considerable sacrifices on all sides. And, and, and here's my last question, then I'll turn it to the audience. Do you, it, do you think that the Americans, Secretary Kerry, and you guys sitting up here actually want a deal more than the Israelis and the Palestinians who live there now? Well, it's a very interesting question because the circumstances for a deal in Israel and Palestine are not optimal uh, for two reasons. One, Palestinians on the West Bank don't have it all that bad, certainly not compared to Gaza. Uh, the GNP has grown on the West Bank. If you go to Ramallah, as I've gone on many occasions, it's a beautiful city, uh, high tech. Uh, things are not bad for many, many Palestinians. Things are very bad for some Palestinians who live near the security barrier, whose farms and houses are divided by the security barrier. No doubt about that. But, you know, usually peace comes about when both sides find it intolerable. Israel is living a very, during a very good time, prosperity. Uh, there's been very little terrorism. Most of the attacks on Israel have been against people who are largely disenfranchised, the people of Stayrot, who are not particularly right. politically influential. So, you know, it's, it's a variation it's an of the Tsurus, the the Tsurus theory of Jewish survival, right. that we need Tsurus to survive. Maybe we need Tsurus to make peace. So um, I, I'm not sure that the optimum conditions for peace. Also, I think the Obama administration, although I'm a supporter and I voted for him and I consider myself a friend of the administration, made mistakes early on in the beginning. They got out in front of the Palestinians okay. I don't go on the 67 those, lines. Okay. okay, Peter, can't, I mean, it does feel that there is not a sense of urgency. The urgency that you, that you guys project on this stage is m lacking in the Israeli political discourse and in the Palestinian well, political I, I, discourse. I think, what I, to be done? I think, 
I don't think one can equate the situations among Israel and the Palestinians. Um, the, I'm not equating them, uh, yeah, but no, no, they no, both no. lack the, the, urgency well, in that sense. I, I think pal pal Palestin Palestinians have lived without citizenship, without the right to vote, under military law, and without of basic freedom of movement right for they 40 vote in Palestinian elections. Uh, when right. Israel decided, but Israel last year arrested the speaker of the Palestinian parliament near Ramallah. Remember because the they last don't have, election no state took place there's, over the objection there's, there's, of Israel. There's no, broad there's point. no they, they have no state whose government for which they can Fine. vote, right? They're not, so? they, uh, and, 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 but there is also a sense of despair amongst Palestinians, and many Palestinians are living off foreign aid coming from the Palestinian Authority, but sooner or later, I think if you talk to any Palestinian, sooner or later, there is going to be another intifada because people will not live indefinitely without the basic human rights that all of us would want. On the Israeli side, I think Alan partly got it right. This is what makes me so, so afraid. If Israel pretends that the Palestinians don't exist because the Palestinians are not killing them, because there is not much terrorism coming from the West Bank, then the message you send to Palestinians is, the only way we can get your attention is to kill you and to, to commit acts of terrible terrorism. That's what's so frightening to me. That's why it's so important that people in the United States who have influence with Israel try to use this moment before the next intifada breaks out to act before, Let God forbid, people I get think, blown up why again. I think that's Whoever wrong. wants Just to ask a one, question, one last could, point. think about lining up okay. on the One microphone. last point. The last intifada started right after Israel offered 92, 3, 5, 7, whatever you want to think, percent. And Arafat started it. He obviously, Sharon gave him an excuse by going up to the Temple Mount. That was a planned, Not according calculated to the intifada designed by Arafat. He said, That's not what the Mitchell me, Commission says, Alan. That's not what who says? The, the Mitchell Commission, which was sent to investigate the cause of the second intifada, that, said the but opposite. That's the truth. That's the reality. And that's what happened. You know, when you get commissions sent to try to share the blame, the Peel Commission also shared the blame as to who started the 1937, 38, 39 riots. The reality is that Arafat planned this, the, that intifada, and uh, I think the first intifada was more spontaneous. I don't disagree with you that I think there's always that sort of Damocles hanging over the head. And it's amazing, we've had a whole discussion without mentioning the one issue that Israelis talk about all the time and obsess about and think about and what's putting it, the Palestinian issue out of their head, and that is Iran, 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 and Iran. That's what's obsessing. It's not true, Israel. Alan. It wasn't an issue, and it wasn't a major election issue in it, Israel. Because the major there's, election nothing, is there's nothing to vote about involving candidates. But when you talk to Israelis, they are very worried about a nuclear-armed Iran and they're very worried about the Syrian, uh, who's going to win not in the Syrian. Social Israeli protests were not about today. Iran. Yeah, Israeli Yair Lapid's politics. rise was not about it's Iran. It's driving Israelis. Israelis care deeply about that, and they worry and they obsess about it. And that's what's on the mind of many Israelis, the external threats. And the Palestinians today do not pose an existential threat to Israel. Okay. So we will uh, turn it over to you guys. Uh, you've stood up, and you, so just, uh, you know, the usual warning, please don't make an enormous speech. Feel free to say something, but uh, make it a question. Thank you both for uh, an interesting discussion. Uh, Professor Dershowitz, I was in your 1L class about uh, eight years ago, and you stood up in class and said, you know, this is actually really hard for me because I'm actually quite a shy person. Uh, and I shook my head then, and I shake my head again now because I'm not quite sure that's true. Uh, but my question is, you all address the crisis of Zionism from the perspective of what's going on in Israel. And I know, uh, Mr. Bynott, you've written a bit about this in terms of uh, describing your own change in thinking on, on Israel. What about the crisis of, of Zionism from the perspective of young American Jews? Uh, it's not merely that uh, young American Jews, I think, uh, view Israel's treatment of Palestinians through a lens of, of some illegitimacy. But it's also that they look at Israel and what's going on domestically in Israel among Jews as something that they don't identify with. And, you know, I, I understand that the Jewish community in the United States is no more monolithic than it is in Israel. But I was wondering if you guys could talk a little bit about how that's a crisis in Zionism, how young American Jews and how they see Israel uh, is creating uh, separation between the Jewish community here uh, and Israelis there. Okay, great. Uh, Peter, it's kind of a specialty of yours, so... Um... Um, look... The, the single biggest reason that younger American Jews are more distant from Israel is because they're more distant from all things Jewish. 
because we have produced the, 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 one of the largest and wealthiest and most Jewishly illiterate populations in the history of the Jewish people. And because we have done so, uh, we have created a, a, a generation of people who are distant from Israel because Israel is simply another thing. If you've never had any experience of Simchas Torah or Shavuot or had a meaningful Jewish experience in the United States, you're not going to be that connected to Israel. That's part of the problem, and that's part of why my book is about Jewish education and why I think it's so important. But even, what's interesting is that even if you look outside the Orthodox community at the most religiously committed young American Jews too, the young reform, reconstructionist, conservative rabbis, the people in the independent Midian movement, these people who are very Jewishly affiliated, they're also becoming more alienated from Israel. And there it is because they, have a, because the, they don't see their vision of Judaism. Alan's absolutely right. Judaism is an ocean. People interpret it in completely different ways, but they are reconciling, trying to reconcile Jewish commitment with liberal democratic ideals, and they don't see Israel's policies, especially in the West Bank, as doing that. And even therefore, if they may be connected to Israeli society, they spent time there, they speak Hebrew, they are alienated from the Israeli state. And that, I think, is something which is going to have big repercussions for Israeli-American Jewish relations in the decades to okay. come. So I Alan, think this you disagree? is. I, I completely disagree on this one. Um, um, I think if you start introducing uh, more Judaism into young people, have more of them go to Jewish day schools, have the federal government pay for yeshiva, what we're going to have is a lot more Jews who care deeply about Israel and are, I agree with you up to now, but are deeply committed to the Israeli right. Um, that's what happens. When you get kids who go to yeshiva and kids who get Orthodox Jewish education, for the most part, they don't produce the Peter Beinharts of the world. They produce the people who uh, booed me at the Jerusalem Post conference last week when I talked about the two-state solution and when I talked about ending the settlements. Um, I, you, know, you might think I'm not liked by the, the hard left. I'm hated more by the Jewish right, the extreme Jewish right, the very people who are Jewishly educated. So Jewish education is also a double-edged sword. And um, many of my students um, who were in your class who are the strongest Zionists um, are not Jewishly educated. They care about Israel because of human rights uh, issues. Uh, you may remember, I think in your class, Mitch Weber, who was one of the leading uh, Zionist voices on the Harvard campus, who was a completely uh, secular atheist uh, uh, Jew who married a woman who's not Jewish, whose whole life is devoted to caring about, about uh, Israel. So I don't see the close connection between religion and Zionism. It didn't start that way. Uh, Herzl, Ben-Gurion, Golda Meir. Um, um, and you don't so see a risk of increased separation as a result. I don't. I think okay. the answer is very different. I think, it's, I think in 1967, Jews were able to beat their chest and say, wow, we're proud to be Israel. Look how, look how okay. tough Israelis are. It was a source of pride. Today it's a source of embarrassment. Because of the occupation? No. Because, because of what? Because of their friends. Because of, friends. Uh, because of Stephen Hawking because of the well, Brits. that's about the because, occupation. No, it's not. It's not about the occupation. If the occupation ended tomorrow, you would find the same You think hatred. Stephen Hawking wouldn't go to Israel? Absolutely. And I think twice, if you look, ago. I understand that. And what he, whether he accepted the invitation two months ago, what happened? Did the Israelis start the occupation in the last two months? He got a lot of pressure in two months. What we're seeing is today, if you go to dinner uh, at, a, at a university dinner and you speak up in behalf of Israel, favor of Israel, it is an embarrassment. But it's Alan, not an I, embarrassment it's because, because of, of what Israel's, Israel's do. It's, it's because of what Israel can is. I, can I, right. And the yeah, DBS movement is growing. And the no, no, DBS no. movement does not talk about the occupation. Right. The occupation DBS talks about is the occupation That's of true. 48, what... the occupation of from the ocean Okay. to the sea, so I it's, do not it's, believe look, it's that. It's definitely true that there are a lot of people who don't want Israel to exist as a Jewish state, and that there are many important people in the BDS movement who take that view. But if you, believe, if you don't believe that their efforts are being fueled by people's anger at what happens in the West Bank and Gaza, you're just not connected to reality. And this is the problem with the Jewish community. We go to Israel all the time, and it's wonderful. But where we don't go, on birthright, our synagogue trips, or anywhere, we don't go to experience Palestinian life in the West Bank. And as a result, we are disproportionately ignorant. It's actually the non-Jews who go and see those things. And when you go and see those things, I was there last week. Believe me, there's an Israeli flag on my kid's wall. I love Israel. It is deeply, 
deeply upsetting and deeply angering to see the way that people are forced to live because they lack basic. And it's that anger which is leading to the BDS anti-Zionist getting more and more support and, f and leading to those, some of those that's, Jewish kids you, hearing from their friends. But that's you, the BDS movement have never been to Israel. They've never seen right. the West no, Bank. They, right, They're we got just it. We got being it. We got politically it. correct. They're Please, being lemmings who are being led the it. way the ignoramus Alan, uh, Stephen Hawking, who doesn't know anything about the Middle East, right, was led Hawking by story. pressure by his fellow academics. That's what it's about okay. today. It's an embarrassment. Sure. Your question. I'm very surprised that the three of you haven't mentioned anything about the Israeli Declaration of Independence. It's uh, the foundation of their government, just like Jefferson's Declaration of Independence is the foundation of ours. And it could lead to another way out of the problem. You may not be able to make, uh, uh, you may not want to make a second state. The problem could be decided in, in, it's not decided in, inside of Israel by using the Declaration of Independence. What about the Declaration? Israel has a Declaration of Independence. I understand that. It's the foundation of their government like ours is the foundation but, of but ours. Can I, can I, the problem is that that Declaration of Independence promises a, uh, a Jewish state, sorry? A Jewish state that offers complete equality, equality of social, equality. complete equality of social and political rights to its inhabitants, irrespective of race, religion, and sex. The only way in which you can resolve that tension between equal citizenship and also a state that offers a refuge for the Jewish people is within a two-state solution. In the context of a one-state solution, it will not be a state that offers refuge for the Jewish people, it, and, and, and therefore, it will, it, I, don't, I think it ultimately it will probably be civil war, but the point is, you can live up to Israel's Declaration of Independence, or at least get much closer to it within the context of a two-state solution. Right now, Israel has been violating those core principles in its Declaration of Independence for 45 years by controlling millions of people who, by virtue of not being Jewish, lack citizenship and the right to vote and live under military. And have refused to accept a two-state solution since 1938. So, okay. you know, again, you don't blame just Israel for the lack of a two-state solution. Sir. In the pre previous discussion, time was not made for comments from the audience, but something that happened there I think is illustrative of, of why there's been so little progress with a peace process in recent years. The discussion was billed as one about... Um, is it possible to find a, in the, a peace process and a two-state two solution? And halfway through the discussion, which initially was going in that direction, Mr. Dershowitz said, if you ask Israelis what are the three most important things to them, it's Iran, Iran, Iran. Halfway through, and I think changed, it was the last 10 seconds. Uh, no, no, he changed the discussion to ten nothing but Iran. 10 seconds before it was over, rest. be accurate. No, today it was 10 seconds oh. before. And so, it was nothing but Iran for the rest of the evening. And I think You know, this, you're just lying. This mirrors... Iran came up can at I the finish? last point We're of the last about, question. I think he means the last debate. He means the last talking about last time. Last time. Last time. I'm sorry. Right, right. I thought we couldn't talk last time. They were talking about now last right. November. Now, this is what... These people weren't this here. This is what... I bet plenty of them were. All right. So this mirrors what Benjamin Netanyahu does. Iran, Iran, Iran all the time, existential threats, red lines, and nobody gets a chance to talk to him about okay. the peace process as so you're a result. That's the reason and when that they do, he says uh, no preconditions and that's it. And that is a good reason or part of the reason why nothing's happened for okay. the last two, three years. Thank you. Fair point. So I, get, I, get, I, get, I guess the point is that we should ignore Iran. I, I don't get it. I mean, I don't get it. If you're the Prime Minister of Israel, your main responsibility is to protect your citizens against the threat of nuclear war. And if I were the Prime Minister of Israel, I would be focusing on Iran 23 hours a day and looking to make peace in that 24th hour. But I would keep my priorities straight, and the priority is external destruction of Israel. Israel's soul will take care of itself as long as its body is kept intact. You know, is, the Jews tried to keep their soul alive in the 20s and 30s, and they learned a very important lesson that they should have learned from the Psalms, which says, Hashem oz li amo yitain, Hashem yivarech et amo b'shalom. God will give the Jewish people oz, strength, and only then will there be peace. The only way Israel can make peace is if it's physically strong. 
if it is stronger than all the Arab armies combined, if it can protect itself against an Iranian nuclear threat, yes. okay, then it I, will have the ability I, to make peace. I want peace in Israel, but I want Israel to survive more than I want peace in Israel. Israel has a, uh, the, Israel look, has I, a I, couple I, of look, hundred I, nuclear I, I, weapons, I, I, I and Iran think, may also, or may not sorry, be sorry, trying just, to build I one. I also, think, I also think that Iran is a major challenge, and I think Iran getting a nuclear weapon would be a terrible thing, not only for Israel, but for the whole region. But the message of the gatekeepers, if any of you have seen it, which was, which was interviews with six former heads of the Shin Bet, is precisely that Israel's ethical character and its physical security are intertwined. This was the bet that Israel's founders made when they mm -hmm. yoked Zionism to democracy, that ultimately, if Israel surrenders its democratic character, it will not be able to survive physically because in today's age, any non-democratic government is living on borrowed time. Any non-democratic government has a huge legitimacy problem in today's world. And that's why you can't distinguish so easily Israel's democratic survival and its physical survival. I, I don't disagree with that, but no matter the worst case scenario, Israel is still among the top 5 or 10% of the countries in the world in terms of democratic Not values, in the West Bank. In terms of the judiciary, in terms of the rule of law, in terms of equality for women, equality for gays. Israel's soul is not in grave turmoil today. Alan, it Alan, could Alan, improve. Alan, Alan, it could get Bank. better. Alan, have you been, Gal Israel, Gal Alan. Israel on the West Bank, the worst case scenario, Israel on the West Bank is more democratic than any Muslim or Arab state in the right, world today. Alan, uh, Alan, and Alan. there is more democracy on the West Bank, more freedom of speech, more freedom to criticize, more freedom to get an education, I'm, Alan, I think to, Israel on the West Bank, it's a three Alan, or a four on a scale you need to, of ten. Alan, you need to spend yeah. more time there. I spend a lot of time <laughs> go, on the go West to, Bank. Go to, right, go, Street, the, go to Shahada Street in, in, in Hebron, where Palestinians are literally not allowed to walk on the street, even if they live on that street, and tell me that Israel's soul in Hebron is doing well. Okay. I'm not, uh, you don't look Enough. at one Enough. place in isolation. <laughs> you look at the entire context. You've got five more minutes. Go ahead. I think you both pointed out very well that there's resistance to the peace process from both sides. So let's say nothing happens. Where will we be 20 years from now? Okay. That's, I, that's a version of a question I tried to ask you. How long can it go on before uh, your sense of crisis grows? I'll tell both Ehud Barak and Ehud Omer have answered that question. With the word apartheid. With the word South Africa. Uh, and the word apartheid, uh, uh, that, that Israel will be one state which permanently has millions of people who, are, who lack basic rights because they are not of the right nationality, ethnicity, religion, whatever you want to call it. And those people, with the backing of much of the world, will be involved in a process of overturning the entire existence of the state and turning it into what they can call a secular binational state, in which I personally believe will be a bloody civil war. And that's exactly what I fear. Is, Israel will never be a binational a secular state. If it becomes a binational state, it will become a binational Muslim state uh, because the Palestinians will never allow a secular state. Uh, and if they do get a majority, they will turn Israel-Palestine. They'll name it Palestine. They'll, or maybe they'll name it something else. Uh, uh, that will have a more Muslim meaning but to it. But it won't be but a vote. It, it will be... The Jews will have the guns. I, I, I understand, but you're talking about it being a secular bi-national state. What makes you think it would be secular? Why I agree with you, by the way. Secular. Uh, so, look, I, I think... I don't, I don't accept your hypothetical. I think within 20 years we're going to see uh, substantial progress toward peace because I think the, democratic, the, the demographic issues are impossible. Israel will never appropriately the West Bank, notwithstanding Ehud Barak, notwithstanding Ehud Olmert, Israel will never be an apartheid government. It will always exist under the rule of law. There will always be votes on the West Bank. There will always be elections. Will it be a perfectly democratic country? No, absolutely not. And that's why the Palestinians must sit at the negotiating table. When you want to change, the burden is on you to begin the negotiations toward that change. And the unwillingness of the Palestinians to come to the negotiating table is today the major barrier to progress toward peace. I mean, there is no reason why the Palestinians shouldn't barrier? sit down and Look, negotiate. Alan, Remember that the Israelis no, gave them a settlement no, freeze. I, I don't. 
the, first of all, and for nine months, the, 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 the Palestinians more, with more, a settlement there freeze was more building, wouldn't come. There was more come. building on the West Bank during that settlement that. freeze than there had been in 2008. I understand that. That's, that's not a reason. Look, 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 the Palestinians not negotiated not without a settlement freeze with Ehud Omer because he was within the parameters of 67 plus swaps. If, and Obama, if Netanyahu would enter those parameters in which there would be a chance of actually reaching a deal, then the, uh, the settlement freeze issue would not be nearly as big an issue. But when you're talking about negotiating with a guy who's not within your basic so, parameters. So he, I support, let me say, let me, let me just tell you one more thing. Here. I support, look, I, I wrote an op-ed with you. I support the Dershowitz plan. Right. The Dershowitz plan is that there should be a settlement freeze in at least part of the West Bank and there should be negotiations. Because although I want the Palestinians to go to the negotiating table, I also understand that there is something unfair about them negotiating over the size of the pie when Israel keeps building and building and taking more of the pie over which they can negotiate. So Peter, that is a legitimate my, here's objection. Here's my final question to you. The Israelis have had an election. They voted for Netanyahu. What would you do? Would you undo the election? How would you bring about these results? Israel is a democracy. Israel it is voted for who it voted for. Israel is we not don't, wait a minute, we don't get to vote in Israel. Uh, I have a deal for you. Next time there's an election, you and I will go to Israel and we'll urge people to vote for the peace party. And maybe we'll win. But in the meantime, we're dealing with a democracy. And a democracy represents the will of the people. So what would you do to bring about peace? Would you overrule the will of the people? Would you impeach the, the prime the minister? The How do you here, bring about your uh, desired Alan, results when Israel, in a democracy? In terms of Israel, when you're talking about Israeli policy in the West Bank, Israel is not a democracy because well, no, no, no. the I'm vast majority of people who live in the West Bank are, do not have the right to vote. If they did, it would be a radically you different outcome. You're, trying to persuade you're missing them. My, my point. My point is within the green line, Israel is a democracy. Yes. They vote against your view and my view. What do we do? We How stand do we up. Get them to we stand their up. Views? We stand up as Americans and say this is bad for American national security, and we stand up as Jews and say that. Our honor is on the line in the question of how Jews use power. That the Jewish ethical tradition forged in powerlessness if, if, is disgraced if we turn around and turn against the very vision that inspired the world when we wrote it in our sacred book. That's what we do. That. Then, and then if you lose and you try to persuade them, then if it, then and, if it, and then what happens? What do you do? Is, look, Israel is not going to, in the United States is Israel's only important strategic partner right. in the world. If the United States president said that the, that the relationship with the United States is going to change if you do not support the 67 parameters, it would, the, believe so, me, the Israeli government would fall. Bush once said that, Baker said that, and, uh, and Shamir and, fell. And, and, and no, and there's been different elections and different results in different elections. There's no question who Barack Obama preferred in the last election. There's probably little doubt who the Israelis preferred in the last election. But in democracies, the people who live in the countries vote. All I'm yes. saying to you again, and, and this is a continuation of my common theme, Peter, it's more complex than you think it is. And in a democracy, it's just okay, more complex and more difficult. There are no simple-minded solutions. I don't think Peter there are simple-minded solution, solutions if you here, don't Alan. believe in but Israeli let, democracy. Let me, uh, let me if you just... give weight to what the people voted for, <laughs> okay. it's far more difficult than we sitting at City College telling the Israelis how to vote and how to negotiate and how to You're deal the guy with, with the plan, destiny. Alan. You're yeah. the guy with the plan, so hold on. My plan okay. is a suggestion okay. for people to accept well, or reject. We, we have the right to decide what we think is best for the United States. Right. I believe that America must always support Israel's security interests and give Israel a security technological advantage. But we as Americans and as Jews do not have to fund and support the settlement enterprise, I which agree. is destroying Israel's democratic okay. character. I and agree. we can have a president who says that very loudly. And the last point is yep. that punctuality is next to godliness. It's 8 o'clock. Thank you all very much. Thank you.